What's up, YouTube? This is your friend, the Neighborhood Movie Nerd, back to give you guys everything that is going on in the world of movies and TV. Guys, let's talk about David Fincher, a name that might not be known to all, but has certainly made an impact in the film industry the last couple of years. A man who got to start at ILM and eventually moved on to being the biggest music video and commercial director on the scene, even working in the same vein as Michael Bay and Spike Jones in the 90s. Fincher would go on to focus on dark, gritty crime dramas and social satires poking fun at a broken system, all in service of one central theme, control. He's a guy who's very precise about what he wants and how much it's going to cost and his experiences working in the film industry from a young age has given him a level of need for control unequaled by many other directors. He has an eye for talent unlike many other people, and his work has been the subject of some of the most important social impacts to our society in recent memory. Not to mention that he revolutionized the television model as well with his production on House of Cards. So, in honor of Mank being released on Netflix this weekend, I'm going to cover this major modern auteur in the next installment of my Director's Ranked series. This is David Fincher, Ranked. The Game. Well, oh, apparently this movie doesn't. For a movie this intense and ingeniously well-woven, for the payoff to be this lame is really beneath someone like Fincher. Described by him as, and I quote, Scrooge lured into Mission Impossible situation with a steroid shot of the sting. Michael Douglas's Nicholas Van Orton is gifted for his 48th birthday a voucher from Consumer Recreational Services by his younger brother, played by Sean Penn. His life then turns upside down as a series of mysterious escalating events start to consume his everyday routine. The twists and turns this movie takes are certainly something, and the way in which Fincher continuously messes around around with Michael Douglas' perception of reality and how it compares to his own life is exceptionally well done as well. But the problem is all in the ending. This is one of those movies where the ending completely torpedoes the rest of it because without spoiling anything, it's one of those endings that on a second viewing really throws into question just what it is exactly the movie is trying to say. It's an exceptionally well done mystery thriller, but one leaves off with an unsatisfying huh of an ending. Alien 3. Okay, I just want to be the first person to say this. All the Alien movies are structured the exact same way. Now, with that being said, this movie, ironically enough, considering that Fincher has been very vocal about his time working on this movie, is probably the most different and last interesting Alien movie we're ever going to get. The behind-the-scenes problems of this movie are very well known, with the movie going through many different directors before it finally got to Fincher's hands, and the final product went through so many edits and re-edits that the final cut barely even resembles a David Fincher movie, so much so to the point that he's gone out of his way to disown and discredit it as his work. But with all that being said, this film does actually offer up some interesting perspectives, as Ripley's latest Alien adventure brings her to an all-male dominated prison world. The comparison of the primarily female xenomorph species with a cast made up of predominantly male actors contains so many interesting themes in and of itself, and that's not even getting into the greater overall implications this movie was hinting at for the future of the franchise, but the overall production problems and directions the story went and makes this feel like an Elseworlds alien adventure at best, especially when considering the fate of certain characters from the previous film. It's certainly an interesting watch, and it's not even close to being on the level of some other really terrible entries into this canon, but for the purposes of this list, it's the least resembling of any of Fincher's films, and is famously the movie that made him never want to lose control on any of his projects ever again. Curious Case of Benjamin Button, the most interesting film in Fincher's entire filmography. Fincher is such an apathetic director that it's rather fascinating that he chooses to adapt F. Scott Fitzgerald, of all people. This movie plays out like a mix between Forrest Gump and Hugo, telling the generational story of Benjamin Button, an oddity of a human being who's born with the exterior of a 90-year-old and proceeds to age in reverse, experiencing a majority of the 20th century from a literal reverse experience. I'm not going to say that I hate these types of stories because I still very much enjoy Forrest Gump, but the idea of Fincher choosing this as his project following Zodiac, one of the most viscerally depressing movies of the last 20 years is odd, to say the least. Nevertheless, he pulls it off, with Brad Pitt portraying the reverse aging character with E, showing off a character experiencing America in the midst of its most transformative time with a humble, melancholic mood and a very firm grip on the many tragedies that inevitably befall him. Button's reverse ageism is set in conjunction with a clock that's built in Grand Central Terminal at the beginning of the movie that checks in reverse due to its creator's wish that it may reverse time and allow the soldiers of World War I to return home to their families, immediately setting up the theme of different perspectives amongst people who are largely outsiders in an ever-changing society. It's an oddly emotional turn for Venture, but it's one that if given a chance, contains a lot more than just another generational story. Panic Room. The best possible version of what this would have been like today would have been a slightly above average Blumhouse horror movie. A divorcee and her daughter moving into a brownstone in Manhattan may seem like the ideal post-divorce purchase, but when a trio of criminals break into their house that very same night, the mother and daughter, portrayed by Jodie Foster and a pre-Twilight Kristen Stewart, hide in the panic room installed in Foster's bedroom. The only problem? The bearer bonds the criminals are after are in said panic room, which is impenetrable from the outside. They say that tension is the best way to keep people invested in a feature film, and Fincher's tight tracking shots and incredible use of 
some limited space, give this film a tightness that is lacking from a majority of the other entries into this type of a genre. The other great thing about this film is that it's a perfect example of how to examine a story from top to bottom, because everything that happens in this movie is pitch perfectly set up and executed from minute one to minute 120, with a rock solid script entry from Jurassic Park writer David Kett. It's tight, lean, thrilling, daring, and albeit a little unnecessary with the CGI, but as a thrill ride from beginning to end, to say the least. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. What happens when you mix James Bond, Rooney Mara, and one of the most intriguing yet disturbing mystery novels of the 20th century? Apparently the grunge version of the Immigrant Song. Just kidding, that's only the opening credits, which are incredible to say the least. Fincher is well known for revolutionizing the television genre with House of Cards, but it's so fascinating to see where that style came from, as a lot of it can be found in the pinpoint precision that is in this movie. Based on the 2005 Stieg Larsson novel, the story follows disgraced journalist Michael Blumfist, who is recruited by an aging reclusive billionaire in order to locate his grandniece, who's been missing for over 40 years. His search brings him into direct contact with hacker Elizabeth Salander, who has had a troubled life, to say the least. Among the many things that make this film one of the best adaptations of one of the best mystery stories ever made, Fincher's playing around with traditional film structure is what catches my eye the most. This movie's close to two hours and 40 minutes long, adapting pretty much everything that occurs in the novel. But the interesting thing is that the actual mystery itself is solved directly at the two-hour mark, which normally is where the narrative would come to a natural conclusion. But Fincher is so good that he adds an extra 20 minutes of material to truly wrap everything up, which is awesome because if they had tried to make this today, it probably would have ended up being a series. While the more novelist elements are certainly over-dramatized, the general mystery and the chemistry between the lead characters helps to illustrate the overall general theme of loss and tragedy in a rather graphic way. It really is a shame we never got the rest of this trilogy from Fincher, because this could have easily gone on to be one of the best mystery thriller franchises of all time. But alas, we only have the one movie. Fight Club, the 90s version of Wolf of Wall Street. Based on the graphic novel by Czech Palahniuk, the film has become a cult classic in recent years due to how well its incredible themes have aged about the never-ending battles between Gen Xers and consumerism. But the interesting thing about this movie is that while its message has aged incredibly well, the actual intricacies of how it works as a story surprisingly have not. Ed Norton and Brad Pitt's individual characterizations as the narrator and eponymous Tyler Durden give the film an appearance of the near-do-well beaten down by society and the rebel who gives him a new lease on life with his out-of-the-box thinking and overall general disdain for the conformity most people have, but where the two butt heads is in the climax. Because of all the incredible twist endings that came out of the late 90s and early 2000s, the Tyler Durden twist in this movie has surprisingly aged the worst. Only because Ed Norton's general feelings of emasculation combined with fight clubs emasculating feelings due to society almost seem to be playing against each other rather than towards a common goal, which could also be how the movie wants you to feel. Look, I don't know. It's an insane concept that still is revolutionary to the point where Brad Pitt even stated that he didn't know if he would ever work on anything this good again. It was Fincher's contribution to the rage against the machine mentality of the 90s, and it's another one of those movies that's become a cultural icon, albeit for potentially some of the wrong reasons. Zodiac. If 7 wasn't enough of an indicator that Fincher enjoys nihilistic material, then this solidified it. Zodiac is one of those interesting cases in which the Marvel-ness of it, where I heard about it while researching Fincher movies and discovering that Robert Downey Jr. and Mark Ruffalo were in one of them, kind of almost gave this film a second life, because the interesting thing is that throughout the last couple of years, I've heard a lot more positive feelings for it than at the time when this was released. Which is odd considering that this is still one of the best reviewed films of 2007, and is arguably held up by many to be one of the best films of the last century. The film chronicles the long, arduous, and ultimately unsuccessful hunt for the Zodiac Killer, who famously terrorized the Bay Area of California in the late 60s and early 70s. It's told from the perspective of three men, Robert Graysmith, a cartoonist, Paul Avery, a crime reporter, both of whom worked for the San Francisco Chronicle, and police detective Dave Toshi. The film breaks down just how much the case, as well as the inherent revelations it brought with it about human nature, wore down on and eventually broke all three of these guys in the process. The film is an odd reflection of the actual film shoot, in which Downey and Ruffalo famously spoke about Fincher's obsessive nature, which is one of those odd real-life parables that reflects the characters' respective moods towards the hunt. It's a case presented through the guise of people becoming more and more disillusioned with society, because it's a case that shows the futility in it. The Zodiac killings were the subject of one of the biggest and longest-running cases in America at a time where things like that could be defined in such a way. Besides being an obvious influence for a sophomore Netflix outing Mindhunter, Fincher really showed here with this film just how much lack of hope and despair the human psyche as a collective is truly capable of. 7. The movie that kicked off the serial killer trend before it was popular. After the disaster that was Alien 3, Fincher needed to distance himself and took a year-long break. Despite stating that he wished he would die of colon cancer before doing another movie, he became drawn to the script by Andrew Kevin Walker due to it being a connect-the-dot movie that delivers about inhumanity. Besides being the first movie that truly showed what he was capable of as a director, this is the film that truly sent Fincher down the path of expressing what human beings are really capable of and how it in turn can cause others to become disillusioned. The film, which normally would be a series of tropes, dying a slow, painful death, and 
instead breathes fresh new life into a stale genre by forcing its characters to confront things that both disturb them and ask questions they aren't ready to ask. Morgan Freeman's Detective Somerset is a detective who was on his way out because he's had enough of the job, but a fresh new face in Brad Pitt's young Detective Mills, along with the introduction of a serial killer whose victims play out like the seven deadly sins, unleashes a new horror that neither detective is ready to deal with. With the revelation of Kevin Spacey's John Doe and a tragic ending that is still inspiring memes today, Fincher made his mark on the world and the world of cinema, showing a fresh new face that was one of many that would go on to define a whole new generation of artists. Gone Girl. What happens when you mix the guy who directed Seven with an author whose source material is so twisted she had to adapt it herself? After Jedi mind-tricking Reese Witherspoon out of the rights of this property, Fincher broke tradition by having author Gillian Flynn stay on for the entirety of the writing process rather than leaving the project after submitting the first draft, a common practice with authors. The result is a brutally honest and frankly disturbing portrait of a suburban married life and what goes into simply maintaining that image, balancing expectations of who you are as a person versus who society wants you to be. Fincher continues to top himself as a mystery director by having these we start out as an unreliable whodunit before flipping the script and turning it into a complete cat and mouse game of survival for the second hour. A twist at this point of the story should not work, but Fincher and Flynn pull it off with ease. The massive amount of twists, turns, and downright disturbing material surrounding Nick and Amy Dunn's relationship is already intriguing enough, but the film's comments on public perception versus reality are tantamount to behold. The movie's take on Ben Affleck's career as a whole is insane, especially considering that Birdman and examination of Michael Keaton's entire career came out around the same time in 2014. Rosamund Pike being brought in to exude a Faye Dunaway-esque presence, all to be used as a mask for her inherent psychosis, just brings a new level to the already heightened thriller. It's a cat and mouse game unlike any other put to the screen, as well as showing off Fincher's uncanny ability when it comes to talent. The Social Network, the movie that defined the past decade and those to come. It's already been talked about enough how the legendary collision of two masters of their craft ended up creating this movie and contributing to something that would ultimately define a generation. But the thing that's not often talked about enough is just how it came to be. Aaron Sorkin famously adapted Ben Mesrick's at the time unpublished novel, The Accidental Billionaires, based on how little he actually knew or cared about Facebook. And Fincher's attachment was a phenomenon because within the course of three days in which Fincher received and looked over the script, the movie was a go. With superstar producers Amy Pascal and Scott Rudin behind them, Fincher and Sorkin were able to collaborate on a project that complemented both their respective strengths and gave us the people a movie that acts a bit like revisionist history, but in reality exposed us to a new type of behavior and pattern that is still largely dominating our society today. Fincher has always been known for his cynicism towards human beings and our behavior and patterns and what comes of it, but Sorkin's dialogue gave him a whole new playground to work with. He managed to take Sorkin, an absolute master of his craft, known for his overwhelming positivity in his material, and push him to a place that he had not been before, and if you ask me, he's better off for it. But what makes this the best Fincher movie is in addition to being the best film of the 2010s, the nature in which the movie took on a second life in the years following its release is where the discussion is. Despite his statements on the many, many inaccuracies in the film, the way in which Zuckerberg's actions in the film seem to predict every social trend and behavior pattern that has made up the last 10 years, hell, even the last year alone, during which Zuckerberg has appealed towards multiple grand juries to question the legality of the company's actions, as well as the Cambridge Analytica scandal the influences on the previous election, it's simply the best kind of a movie, in that it shifts and flows with time in order to evolve into something that transcends what it originally was attempting to say. It was the movie that, regardless of intention, truly revealed that the power had left the people's hands and entered that of the machine, which among many other things makes it the best Fincher movie. And that is it, people. That is David Fincher ranked all 10 films in his filmography. Are you guys looking forward to Mank on Friday? Did I make you want to watch any of these films? If not, I understand they're very dark in subject matter. But if you did like this list and you do want to keep getting more incredible content from us, make sure you click that subscribe button and the like button and leave us a comment in the comment section below. Click the bell next to the subscribe button. That way you guys get notified every time we put up a new video. We have video content that we put out on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. We have audio podcast content that we put out on Wednesdays, and we have our Mandalorian recap show happening on Fridays at 8 o'clock p.m. People, we have three episodes left, and hopefully they're going to be as banging as the previous five. Make sure you follow us on all our social media, Facebook and Instagram, at Talkin TV Podcast. People, watch more fucking movies. We'll see you next time.